Agatha by Alfred Austin Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes She wanders in the April woods That glisten with the fallen shower She leans her face against the buds She stops, she stoops, she plucks a flower She feels the ferment of the hour She broodeth when the ring-dove broods the sun and flying clouds have power upon her cheek and changing moods. She cannot think she is alone, as o'er her senses warmly steal floods of unrest she fears to own and almost dreads to feel. Among the summer woodlands wide anew she roams, no more alone. The joy she feared is at her side. Spring's blushing secret now is known. The primrose and its mates have flown. The thrush's ringing note hath died. But glancing eye and glowing tone fall on her, from her god, her guide. She knows not, asks not, what the goal. She only feels she moves towards bliss, and yields her pure, unquestioning soul to touch and fondling kiss. And still she haunts those woodland ways, Though all fond fancy finds there now To mind of spring or summer days, A sodden trunk and songless bough. The past sits widowed on her brow. Homeward she wends with a wintry gaze To walls that house a hollow vow. To hearth, where love hath ceased to blaze, Watches the clammy twilight wane, With grief too fixed for woe or tear, And with her forehead gainst the pain, Envies the dying year. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Before the Birth of One of Her Children by Anne Bradstreet Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake All things within this fading world hath end. Adversity doth still our joys attend. No ties so strong, no friends so dear and sweet, but with death's parting blow is sure to meet. The sentence past is most irrevocable, a common thing, yet oh inevitable. How soon, my dear, death may my steps attend, how soon t may be thy lot to lose thy friend. We both are ignorant, yet love binds me these farewell lines to recommend to thee that when that knot's untied that made us one, I may seem thine, who in effect am none. And if I see not half my days that's due, what nature would, God grant to yours and you. The many faults that well you know I have, let be interred in my oblivious grave. If any worth or virtue were in me, let that live freshly in thy memory, and when thou feelest no grief, as I no harms, yet love thy dead, who long lay in thy arms. And when thy loss shall be repaid with gains, look to my little babes, my dear remains. And if thou love thyself, or lovest me, these, O, oh, protect from stepdame's injury. And if chance to thine eyes shall bring this verse, With some sad sighs honor my absent hearse, And kiss this paper for thy love's dear sake, Who, with salt tears, this last farewell did take. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Catawba Wine by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow This song of mine is a song of the vine, to be sung by the glowing embers of wayside inns, when the rain begins to darken the drear Novembers. It is not a song of the scuppernong from warm Carolinian valleys, nor the Isabel and the Muscadel that bask in our garden alleys, nor the red mustang whose clusters hang o'er the waves of the Colorado and the fiery flood of whose purple blood has a dash of Spanish bravado. For richest and best is the wine of the West that grows by the beautiful river, whose sweet perfume fills all the room with a benison on the giver. And as hollow trees are the haunts of bees, for ever going and coming, so this crystal hive is all alive with a swarming and buzzing and humming. Very good in its way, is the versinet or the celery soft and creamy but catawba wine has a taste more divine more dulcet delicious and dreamy there grows no vine by the haunted rhine by danube or guadalquiver nor on island or cape that bears such a grape as grows by the beautiful river drugged is their juice for foreign use when shipped o'er the reeling atlantic to rack our brains with the fever pains that have driven the old world frantic to the sewers and sinks with all such drinks and after them tumble the mixer for a poison malign is such borgia wine or at best but a devil's elixir while pure as a spring is the wine i sing and to praise it one needs but name it for catawba wine has need of no sign no tavern bush to proclaim it and this song of the vine this greeting of mine the winds and the birds shall deliver to the queen of the west in her garlands dressed on the banks of the beautiful river end of poem this poem is in the public domain this poem is in the public domain and recorded for LibriVox.org by James Tiley on January 14th, 2007 in New Meadows, Idaho. The Charge of the Light Brigade by Lord Alfred Tennyson Half a league, half a league, half a league onward all in the valley of death rode the six hundred forward the light brigade charge for the guns he said into the valley of death rode the six hundred forward the light brigade was there a man dismayed not though the soldiers knew someone had blundered theirs not to make reply theirs not to reason why theirs but to do and die into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell rode the six hundred. Flashed all their sabers bare, flashed as they turned in air, Sabring the gunners there, charging an army, while all the world wondered, plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the saber stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not the six hundred. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon behind them volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came throw the jaws of death back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of the six hundred. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made, 
All the world wondered. Honor the charge they made. Honor the Light Brigade. Noble 600. End of poem. The Collar by George Herbert Read for LibriVox.org by Justin Brett I struck the board and cried, No more! I will abroad! What? Shall I ever sigh and pine? My lines and life are free, Free as the road, loose as the wind, As large as store! Shall I be still in suit? Have I no harvest but a thorn to let me blood? and not restore what I have lost with cordial fruit. Sure, there was wine before my sighs did dry it, there was corn before my tears did drown it. Is the year only lost to me? Have I no bays to crown it, no flowers, no garlands gay, all blasted, all wasted? Not so, my heart. But there is fruit, and thou hast hands, Recover all thy sigh-blown age on double pleasures. Leave thy cold dispute of what is fit and not. Forsake thy cage, thy rope of sands, Which petty thoughts have made, And made to thee good cable To enforce and draw and be thy law, While thou didst wink and wouldst not see. Awake, take heed, I will abroad. Call in thy death's head there, tie up thy fears. He that forbears to suit and serve his need deserves his load. But as I raved, and grew more fierce and wild at every word, methought I heard one calling, Child, and I replied, My Lord. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Complaint of Chaucer to His Empty Purse by Geoffrey Chaucer Read for LibriVox.org by Corrie Samuel January 2007 To you, my purse, and to none other white, complain I, for ye be my lady dear. I am so sorry, now that ye be light, for certes but ye make me heavy cheer. Me where as leaf be laid upon my bier, for which unto your mercy thus I cry. Beeth heavy again, or else mot I die. Now voucher safe this day, or hit be night, That I of you the blissful sound may hear, Or see your colour like the sun bright, That of yellowness had never peer. Ye be my life, ye be my heart's steer, Queen of comfort and of good company, Beeth heavy again, or else mot I die. Now purse, that be to me my life's light, And saviour as down in this world here, Out of this town help me through your might, Sin that ye will not be my treasure, For I am shave as nigh as any frere, But yet I pray unto your courtesy, Beeth heavy again, or else mot I die. L'Envoy de Chaucer O conqueror of Brutes Albion, which that by line and free election, been very king, this song to you I send. And ye, that mowen all our harm amend, Have mind upon my supplication. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Crow by John Burroughs Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Drake of Long Branch, New Jersey. 1. My friend and neighbor through the year, Self-appointed overseer of my crops of fruit and grain, Of my woods and furrowed plain, Claim thy tidings right and left. I shall never call it theft. Nature wisely made the law, and I fail to find a flaw in thy title to the earth, and all it holds of any worth. I like thy self-complacent air. 
I like thy ways so free from care. Thy landlords stroll about my fields, Quickly noting what each yields. Thy courtly mien and bearing bold, As if thy claim were bought with gold. Thy floating shape against the sky, When days are calm and clouds are high, Thy thrifty flight ere rise of sun, Thy homing clans when day is done. Hues protective are not thine, So sleek thy coat each quill does shine, Diamond black to end of toe, Thy counterpoint the crystal snow. 2. Never plaintive nor appealing, Quite at home when thou art stealing, Always groomed to tip of feather, Calm and trim in every weather. Hawk and owl in treetop hiding, Feel the shame of thy deriding. Nought escapes thy observation, None but dread thy accusation. 3. Hunters, prowlers, woodland lovers Vainly seek the leafy covers. Noisy, scheming, and predacious, with demeanor almost gracious. Dowered with leisure, void of hurry, Void of fuss and void of worry. Friendly banded Robin Hood, Judge and jury of the wood, Or Captain Kidd of sable quill, Hiding treasures in the hill. Nature made thee for each season, Gave thee wit for ample reason, Good crow wit that's always burnished Like the coat her hair has furnished. May thy numbers ne'er diminish, I'll befriend thee till life's finish. May I never cease to meet thee, May I never have to eat thee, And mayest thou never have to fare, So that thou playest the part of a scarecrow. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Darkling Thrush by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by Arctura I leant upon a coppice gate When frost was spectre grey And winter's dregs made desolate The weakening eye of day a tangled bind stem scored the sky like strings of broken lyres, and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. The land sharp features seemed to be the sentry's corpse outleant, his crypt the cloudy canopy, the wind his death lament, the Asian pulse of German birth was shrunken hard and dry, and every spirit upon earth seemed fervorless as I. At once a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead, in a full-hearted evensong of joy illimited. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, in blast beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar and nigh around, that I could think there trembled through his happy good-night air some blessed hope whereof he knew, and I was unaware. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Flea by John Dunn Read for LibriVox.org by Jacob Martinez Mark but this flea and mark in this, How little that which thou deniest me is. Me it sucked first, and now it sucks thee, And in this flea our true bloods mingled be. Thou knowest that this cannot be said, A sin, or shame, or loss of maidenhead. Yet this enjoys before it woo, And pampered swells with one blood made of two, And this, alas, is more than we would do. O oh, stay, three lives in one flea spare, 
where we almost, nay, more than married are. This flea is you and I, and this our marriage bed and marriage temple is. Though parents grudge and you, we are met, and cloistered in these living walls of jet. Though use make you apt to kill me, let not to that self-murder added be, and sacrilege three sins in killing three. Cruel and sudden hast thou since purpled thy nail in blood of innocence, wherein could this flea guilty be? except in that drop which it sucked from thee. Yet thou triumphst and sayst that thou find'st not thyself nor me the weaker now. Tis true, then learn how false fears be. Just so much honor, when thou yield'st to me, will waste, as this flea's death took life from thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a recording of the poem If by Rudyard Kipling for LibriVox.org. This poem is in the public domain and is read by Jim Tiley in New Meadows, Idaho on January 17, 2007. This, pub this poem is in the public domain. If if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve you long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, Hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and, which is more, you'll be a man, my son. This poem is in the public domain. The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus Read for LibriVox.org by Nick Sanger of Spokane, Washington. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here, at our sea-washed sunset gates, shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp 
beside the golden door. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. New Year's Eve, Midnight by Frederica Richardson MacDonald Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes Dead, the dead year is lying at my feet. In this strange hour the past and future meet. There is no present, no land in the vast sea. Appalled, I stand here in eternity. Darkness upon me, on my soul it weighs. The gloom that is crushed out of the life of days that once knew light has crept into my heart. I have not strength to bid it thence depart. Oh, what is time, and what is life? The fire that thrills my pulses with its large desire? Since at each step I rend a fragment of my soul, and growth means dying, whither is the goal? The old, old question. Yet I do not shrink from bitter truths. I do not fear to drink even to the dregs the cup that tears may fill. I'd know God's truth, though it were human ill. I have cast down the idols in my mind which sought to comfort me for being blind. I need no pleasant lie to cheat the night. I need God's truth that I may walk aright. That and that only, with unflinching eyes, I would tear through the secret of the skies. Smile on, ye stars, in me there is a might which dares to scale your large imperial height. Yet, yet how shall it be? Time sweeps me on, and what one day I hold, the next is gone. The very heavens are changed. The face they wore a moment back is lost to come no more. My soul along the restless current drifts, and to its sight the source of radiance shifts. Wildly I strive some gleam of truth to save, and cry, God help me, battling with the wave. God help me? Well, I know the prayer is vain, although it rush up to my lips again. I know his help was given with the breath that led me thus to struggle against death. No further help, no help beyond the soul, the fragment of himself I hold in my control. From heaven no stronger aid to lead me through the fight, in heaven no higher aim to bind me to the right. Thus stand I on the brink of this new year, darkness upon me, not the work of fear. Powerless, I know, to check the river's sweep. Powerful alone, my own soul's truth to keep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a recording of The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost published in a collection called Mountain Interval in 1920. This recording is for LibriVox.org. This work is in the public domain and read by James Tiley in New Meadows, Idaho. The Road Not Taken Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, 
somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. End of poem. Song, Sweetest Love, I Do Not Go, by John Dunn, read for LibriVox.org, by Jacob Martinez. Sweetest love, I do not go for weariness of thee, nor in hope the world can show a fitter love for me, but since that I must die at last, tis best to use myself in jest, thus by feigned deaths to die. Yesternight the sun went hence, and yet is here today, he hath no desire nor sense nor half so short a way. Then fear not me, but believe that I shall make speedier journeys, since I take more wings and spurs than he. Oh, how feeble is man's power, that if good fortune fall cannot add another hour, nor a lost hour recall. But come bad chance, and we join to it our strength, and we teach it art and length, itself o'er us, to advance. When thou sighest, thou sighest not wind, but sighest my soul away. When thou weepest unkindly kind, my life's blood doth decay. It cannot be that thou lovest me as thou sayest, if in thine my life thou waste, that art the best of me. Let not thy divining heart forethink me any ill. Destiny may take thy part, and may thy fears fulfill. But think that we are but turned aside to sleep. They who one another keep alive never parted be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 5 by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes If I should learn, in some quite casual way, That you were gone, not to return again, Read from the back page of a paper, say, held by a neighbor in a subway train, how at the corner of this avenue and such a street, so are the papers filled, a hurrying man, who happened to be you, at noon today had happened to be killed. I should not cry aloud. I could not cry aloud or wring my hands in such a place. I should but watch the station lights rush by with a more careful interest on my face, or raise my eyes and read with greater care where to store furs and how to treat the hair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 23 by William Shakespeare, for LibriVox.org, narrated by Sean McKinley. As an unperfect actor on the stage, who with his fear is put beside his part, or some fierce thing replete with too much rage, whose strength's abundance weakens his own heart, so I, for fear of trust, forget to say the perfect ceremony of love's right, and in mine own love's strength seem to decay or charged with burthen of mine own love's might. Oh, let my looks be then the eloquence of dumb presagers of my speaking breast, who plead for love and look for recompense, more than that tongue that more hath more expressed. Oh, learn to read what silent love hath writ, to hear with eyes belongs to love's fine wit. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. To His Coy Mistress by Andrew Marvell Read for LibriVox.org by Justin Brett Had we but world enough and time, This coyness lady were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk And pass our long love's day, Thou by the Indian Ganges' side should rubies find. I by the tide of Humber would complain. I would love you ten years before the flood, And you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. 
my vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. A hundred years should go to praise thine eyes and on thy forehead gaze, two hundred to adore each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest, an age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. For, lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at lower rate. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near, and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. Then worms shall try that long-preserved virginity, and your quaint honour turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust. The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow-chapped power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball, and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Upon Julia's Clothes by Robert Herrick Read for LibriVox.org by Beth Peach on the 21st of January, 2007, at Reading, UK When as in silks my Julia goes, then, then, methinks, how sweetly flows the liquefaction of her clothes. Next, when I cast mine eyes and see that brave vibration each way free, Oh, how that glittering taketh me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Valentine by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by Claire Gauget Sent to a friend who had complained that I was glad enough to see him when he came, but didn't seem to miss him if he stayed away. And cannot pleasures, while they last, be actual unless, when past, they leave us shuddering and aghast, with anguish smarting? And cannot friends be firm and fast, and yet bear parting? And must I then, at friendship's call, calmly resign the little all, trifling I grant, it is and small, I have of gladness, and lend my being to the thrall of gloom and sadness? And think you that I should be dumb in full dolorum omnium, expecting when you choose to come and share my dinner, and other times be sour and glum and daily thinner? Must he then only live to weep who'd prove his friendship true and deep, by day a lonely shadow creep, at night time languish, oft raising in his broken sleep the moan of anguish? The lover, it for certain days, his fair one be denied his gaze, sinks not in grief and wild amaze, but wiser wooer, he spends the time in writing lays, and posts them to her. And if the verse flow free and fast, till even the poet is aghast, a touching valentine at last, the post shall carry, when thirteen days are gone and past of February. Farewell, dear friend, and when we meet in desert waste or crowded street, perhaps before this week shall fleet, perhaps to-morrow, I trust to find your heart the seat of wasting sorrow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Where My Books Go by William Butler Yeats For LibriVox.org Narrated by Sean McKinley All the words that I utter, and all the words that I write, must spread out their wings untiring, and never rest in their flight, 
till they come where your sad, sad heart is, and sing to you in the night, beyond where the waters are moving, storm-darkened or starry bright. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.